Hi, everyone. I'm Andre Morrow, and welcome to LPB's live coverage of the governor's opening address to the 2019 session of the Louisiana legislature. We'll hear from Governor John Bell Edwards shortly. First, my partner Natasha Williams is live at the Capitol right now. Natasha, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Andre. Now, the regular session is underway. 800 bills expect to be proposed. 800 bills have been proposed by lawmakers and expected to have discussion and debate on all of those topics from budget surplus to abortion to teachers pay raises and the abolishing of the death penalty. A number of these bills are expected to get a lot of debate as we go along these next 60 days. Now the death penalty is one of those expected to get a lot of that robust debate. Now Senator Dan Clater wanting to end the death penalty here in the state. Now in the next 60 days though there will be a number of topics that will be discussed. Teachers pay raises. Governor John Bell Edwards wants to give $1,000 in pay raise to teachers, $500 to support staff members. That is another issue that will be heavily debated here, possibly. Now, of course, we here at LPB will keep you covered on what's going on here in the next 60 days as lawmakers make some very important decisions affecting people throughout the state. LBP will be covering it gavel to gavel. Right now, though, we're waiting for Governor John Bell Edwards to give his opening address and that will be happening in just minutes. Back to you, Andre. All right, Natasha, thank you so much for that. Of course, an election year uh, this year in Louisiana. And here in studio with me is Barry Irwin, president of Cable Council for a Better Louisiana. You heard Natasha talk about some of those big items, from those to a bill designating I-10 as Saints Highway, Who Dat Nation Highway. Oh, you get so it So you all. have from abortion to that, and uh, as we wait, and uh, the governor getting ready to uh, walk down. Here he is right here, as a matter yeah. of fact, Barry. What are your thoughts, though, as we come into this? Well, you know, it's the last session before the election, and I think that colors things to a great degree. It's a fiscal session, so we're somewhat limited, not totally, but in, in some of the subject matter. So you'll hear a lot about finances and taxes and that type of thing. Uh, so people, I think, typically want to get in, get out of these sessions so they can go back home and campaign. But we shall see whether uh, anything else erupts. Yeah, I mean, do you expect it to be uh, anxious moments? Like last year was just filled with anxiety, okay? Uh, so many special sessions, et cetera. This year, just from the layperson, it doesn't feel that way going in. It should be smoother sailing. The issue this time around is, is even though last year they end up passing a, a deal to kind of extend some taxes for seven years, you would think all the budget issues would be over. Well, lo and behold, uh, another issue has been created by the fact that the Revenue Estimating Conference has not recognized some of those additional dollars. Right. So I think we'll end up seeing some more fireworks over the budget than we probably would ordinarily expect. Well, and do you see that as uh, just uh, political posturing on the side of uh, the Republicans, perhaps, who don't want uh, the governor to be successful, even though they wouldn't necessarily say that? I mean, I think it is to a large degree. I mean, the dollars are there in one form or the other. There, there are two estimates that, that economists put forward. You usually just pick one or the other. Sure. Uh, one can be more conservative. One might have a little more dollars. That's what we've done for all these many years. But this, this year, it's going to be a little bit and, different. And they've never had this before, where this thing hasn't been taken care of in advance. And usually everybody wants to agree on something. Even if you uh, agree on the conservative number, people like to spend more, but you, you spend with the number that you have and you go forward. Um, but I think this year there's, you know, there's still a lot more partisanship in the legislature now than we've seen in years past. Uh, it's just kind of been coming to a kind of a crescendo. And then election year stuff kind of uh, enters into that as well. Right. We've been seeing pictures from uh, the state capitol as uh, they prepare for the speech. And of course, they're uh, the color guard, the flags, their prayers, uh, all before, all preceding the governor's address. Well, and we're watching that things look pretty friendly right now. <laughs> they probably will be for the next uh, maybe 48 hours, and then we'll get into the usual thing where uh, people find things to disagree yeah. about. Would there be something that uh, if you wanted to ask somebody point blank right now that's your biggest question going into the session that you would have? I would say, um, are we going to get through this in, in sort of a, a, a friendly fashion, something that is a little bit more collegial uh, than we've seen in years past, or are we going to find things just to fight about for the sake of fighting about them? I'm afraid that they've gotten into the mode of just fighting about things in a partisan way. Uh, I'm hopeful, uh, now there are some pretty big issues there, but I'm hopeful that maybe uh, with election year and people wanting to get back home, that maybe we'll have more of a collegial atmosphere. What are the items that Cable is uh, following most closely? 
I mean, education, you could guess, but... Sure. That. Well, I think looking at the budget overall, number one. But uh, number two, there are a lot of tax measures on there on the um, on the uh, agenda this year. Most of those, or a lot of them, deal with tax reform and some very positive things that we could do to kind of strengthen our state. They're not tax increases. They're more restructuring. Do I think many of those are going to pass? Probably not. Um, we are interested, obviously, in infrastructure, as many folks are. A big item on the agenda this year, talking about infrastructure, uh, probably a lot of debate there. Again, it's kind of questionable whether any of these things will actually pass. Yeah, bringing it back, LC4, the this road coalition, right. which incorporates uh, big business, uh, and they didn't mention by name, but it appears that Dow Chemical is a, a large player on board. Of course, they're right on the west side, sure. uh, parishes of, of, of uh, West Baton Rouge, and what trouble getting to and from uh, their location. So they have a big interest in this. Sure, and there's another measure in there besides the, the large fuel tax bill that also deals with um, kind of dedicating some dollars from BP settlement to kind of work on that in intracoastal uh, bridge over there. On yeah, the side absolutely, of the right. So that's another big infrastructure piece that's in there. So uh, we now have, have seen that the color guard bringing the flags up to the front right now. Uh, this is live from Louisiana State Capitol here in Baton Rouge. And uh, the governor's address just moments away, uh, his address to the legislature. This is an election year for Governor John Bell Edwards. So uh, it often takes a different tone as you look into it. Uh, the Pledge of Allegiance right now. They should give her a standing ovation, this young lady from Covington, and uh, with her hand over her heart, though, yes. Barry, uh, singing wonderful. a brilliant rendition of the national anthem. That was wonderful. It's a tough song to do. It, it certainly is. She, she nailed it. Uh, we've had one prayer. I wonder if we're going to have another one uh, forthcoming as uh, we prepare for the flags to rest and the governor to speak. And uh, in the last moments before this, uh, not that there's a whole lot of anticipation here, but uh, you see the governor right there on the right hand of your screen as he looks up at the flags. Um, any any other last questions you have, Barry, as you look at this? No, but I think he's going to want to talk about uh, some of the things that are important to him. Teacher pay raises, obviously. I think uh, maybe you'll hear a political jab here or there. I think some of the issues he's pushing again are issues that he's pushed unsuccessfully in the past. Minimum wage, kind of uh, wage equity issues, uh, those types of things. Um, but I think you'll probably hear him on an upbeat note. Um, and. Uh, and we'll see how the reaction is as we go forward. One thing that's interesting, we are just now being handed a copy of his speech, uh, which he's about to give. Normally, there are a few more minutes that we get it ahead of time, but this was right off the presses. We have it now. 
We're uh, giving an ovation to the governor of Louisiana, who is now ready to address the session of the legislature, Governor John Bell Edwards. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I especially want to thank Elizabeth Lewis for gracing us today with a beautiful rendition of the national anthem. And I want to recognize also Cedric Bridges, who is the choral director at Covington High School. Thank you very much, Cedric. Thank you. And Bishop Duca, my bishop, thank you very much for your prayer today. Uh, also, I want to thank all the members of the 415th Military Intelligence Battalion uh, Color Guard who were here to present the colors today. And of course, uh, we are assisted by Brandon Weiss, serving as interpreter. I want to thank Brandon for being here. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, members of the legislature, distinguished guests, state of Louisiana, I am honored to join you for the start of what I hope and expect will be our only legislative session this year. We spent a lot of time together in these chambers over the past three and a half years. But at the end of the day, because of our willingness to come together and put the people of Louisiana first, our state is finally moving in the right direction. Before I begin, I'd like to take a moment to speak with you about the recent disturbing fires at four churches across our state. Three of them have been at historically African-American Baptist churches in St. Landry Parish, Mount Pleasant, St. Mary, and Greater Union, and one in Caddo Parish at Vivian United Pentecostal. I've been in contact with the pastors of all four churches and I have directed the state fire marshal to aggressively investigate these tragic fires alongside our local and federal law enforcement partners. And I want to especially thank State Fire Marshal Butch Browning for his leadership in this investigation. You know, churches... <laughs> churches are sacred places, and no one should fear for their safety in their house of worship and no one should be concerned that their house of worship will be destroyed. Right now, there are more questions and answers, but hopefully the investigation will soon yield information that we can share with the public. Until then, I'm asking everyone to join me and Don in channeling all the frustration, the fear, the anger into prayer and support for the congregations that have lost their churches. Now, with that being said, this is going to be a very different speech than you're used to me delivering on the opening day of session because the budget crisis that for years held Louisiana hostage is over. What, what was once a $2 billion budget deficit is now a surplus that will lay a foundation for us to continue to move the state forward. So you won't hear me talk about a fiscal cliff today. Funding for higher education is stable, TOPS is fully funded, and health care services aren't on the chopping block. <laughs> Together, through partnership rather than partisanship, we restored fiscal stability and responsibility and put an end to the greatest budget crisis in our state's history. I have said before that there is no challenge too great for us to overcome if we work together in good faith. And we have proven that to be true time and time again. And it wasn't easy, you know that. Hard choices and compromises had to be made. But today I can stand before you and say that the state of Louisiana is much stronger and a much better place than we were just a few years ago. And our people agree. LSU's Riley Center recently released a 2019 Louisiana survey, which notes that more people think our state is moving in the right direction and fewer think it's going in the wrong one. Now, to be sure, there's still 
a lot of work to do. But we are putting this state back on a path to more prosperity, more opportunity. We just recently announced that personal income in Louisiana is the highest it has ever been in our history. That's more money going directly into the pockets of our workers. At $252 billion, our GDP is the highest it's ever been. It means that more people, more people are working and our businesses are doing better. It means that the state is producing more than ever before. And make no mistake, Louisiana is open for business. In just the past three years, we've landed more than 128 major new economic development projects that are resulting in more than 27,000 new jobs, retaining over 21,000 jobs, and are resulting in over $33 billion in new capital investment. This means more people will be going to work for the homegrown companies of Waiter and LHC Group in Lafayette. Up in Monroe, CenturyLink, the only Fortune 200 company headquartered in Louisiana, is extending its commitment to our state through 2025. It means, it means in Baton Rouge, Exxon is investing in a polyolefins plant, and that in Shreveport, out-of-state company Super ATV is developing a manufacturing and distribution facility. In New Orleans, it means landing the largest economic development deal in our state's history with DXC Technology. And in Lake Charles, it means that hundreds of folks are working for Citadel Completions and aircraft center, uh, at an aircraft center. In central Louisiana, it means Hunt Forest Products and its joint venture partner have opened a state-of-the-art sawmill in LaSalle Parish. What's the secret to this success? An improving economy and an attractive business climate are essential. But the true key to our economic progress is our workforce. When businesses come to Louisiana, they do so because we have the talent to get the job done. And this would not be possible without our renewed commitment to funding our top-notch universities and technical colleges. By partnering with local businesses, they are creating a pipeline of talent that fuels both established industries and new emerging industry. This is how Louisiana has become a global leader in cybersecurity. And I'm proud to say that next month, the National Governors Association Summit on Cybersecurity will be hosted in Shreveport, Bossier. It's the first time. It's the first time since 1975 that the NGA has brought a meeting to our state. Representatives from all 50 states will be coming here to Louisiana along the I-20 corridor to learn about threats to cyber safety and the cutting edge technology and the workforce being used to combat it. Another key to having a truly productive workforce is having a healthy workforce. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Medicaid expansion is saving lives. Because of expansion, <laughs> because of expansion, more than 480,000 low-income working people now have health insurance. Nearly 65,000 women have received mammograms. 35,000 adults have had colonoscopies. Expansion is also helping with two of our nation's most critical health challenges. 31,000 of our citizens have received treatment for substance abuse, and nearly 100,000 individuals have received mental health services. Expansion has cut the number of uninsured in half to the lowest level in our state's history, and we are generating $3.5 billion in economic activity every year. What's more? What's more, employment in the healthcare sector in Louisiana is at a record high. And while other states that did not expand Medicaid are seeing rural hospitals close, Louisiana has not had a single rural hospital shut down over the past four years. In fact, Louisiana has led the nation in the growth of community health centers. For thousands of Louisianans having access to a hospital or health care facility is literally the difference between life and death. Even in our larger cities, 
Access to affordable care is crucial, which is why I prioritized bringing an emergency room back to North Baton Rouge and ensuring that the LSU Medical School and University Hospital in Shreveport have been stabilized and strengthened. <laughs> However, the true measure of success is not in the dollars we've saved, but in the lives that we've made better. And one of those individuals with a better life is here today. Her name is Elaine English. And for many years, Elaine, who is a college graduate, was gainfully employed until the bottom fell out of the economy in 2009. She was struggling, had to pull money out of her retirement to pay for $1,000 per month medication. But Elaine's story doesn't end there. While seeking treatment for substance abuse, Elaine filled out the paperwork for Medicaid. And under the Medicaid expansion, she was able to get coverage and get her life back on track. She is working, and she is well on her way to becoming a paralegal. <laughs> Elaine's story. <laughs> Elaine's story is about second chances. It's about taking personal responsibility. It's about getting up when life knocks you down. And she credits a strong support team with helping her to get to where she is today. And I am proud of Elaine, and I am proud that Medicaid could be part of that support team. Elaine, if you would, please stand and be recognized. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Expansion is not the only way we've improved access to care. I want to take a moment to point something out. Session after session, the halls of the Capitol were filled with a sea of yellow t-shirts symbolizing parents and children whose livelihoods depended upon waiver services. These yellow t-shirts reminded us over and over again that a 10-year wait is not a service. It is not care. And I want you to know something. We saw you, we heard you, and we acted to end the waiting list for developmental disability waiver services after 25 long years. So to the parents and advocates, while you may be able to retire your yellow t-shirts, I know we can still count on you to be here fighting on behalf of citizens living with disabilities and helping us to create a more inclusive Louisiana. Ending the waiting list is a reminder that the greatest responsibility we have is to care for Louisiana's children, our children. We have taken many steps. We have taken many steps to ensure the well-being of our most precious natural resource. And this is an issue that our First Lady and my wife, Donna, have worked especially hard on and I'm so proud of the work and the difference that she is making for children throughout our state. Working with Secretary of the Department of Children and Family Services, Marquita Walters, and her committed staff, for the third year in a row, we have broken the record for the number of children adopted out of foster care in Louisiana. <laughs> we have wrecked we have revolutionized our approach to foster care through the Quality Parenting Initiative, and we have taken steps to extend the age of foster care to 21 so that young people aren't automatically forced out when they turn 18, like the 150 who aged out just last year. As all of you know, I am strongly committed to protecting human life. But no matter your position on the issue, we should all be able to agree that reducing the number of, abor of abortions in this state is a good thing. I am proud to say that abortions are at a 10-year low in Louisiana. <laughs> also, we've established the toughest laws against human trafficking in the nation and have made huge progress in prevention as well as the way we treat victims. More law enforcement officers and people in our communities are becoming educated about identifying victims. When they see something, they say something. 
which is exactly what we want to happen because that's what it will take to stop the traffickers and rescue the victims. Earlier, I spoke of what we can accomplish when we come together to achieve a common goal. From fixing the budget to passing historic criminal justice reform, we have proven that we are at our strongest when we work together, regardless of party, to put Louisiana first. Perhaps the truest example of this came three years ago when Louisiana was hit with not one but two devastating floods. No one can question the resiliency of the people of Louisiana, our willingness to help one another, to be neighbor to one another in times of need is unparalleled. Another prime example of working together is our securing federal funding for the Comete River Diversion Project, which had been in limbo for 30 years. And this would not have been possible without a unified effort from the local state and from federal officials. And I especially want to thank our congressional delegation. The folks over at CPRA, they've been working hard to secure funding for other critical projects to help mitigate flooding, restore our coastline, and protect our incredible sportsman's paradise. In fact, there will be more investment and more coastal restoration and protection projects underway in 2019 than ever before in Louisiana's history. And remember, we did all of this in spite of simultaneously resolving the largest budget deficit in the history of the state. But we know that there is still much work to do. I imagine many of you share my frustration that fixing the budget impeded our ability to pursue some of the other priorities. So much damage had been done, and we knew it would take years to recover, and in some ways, we're still recovering. But now we have the opportunity to begin making real, lasting change that will positively impact the people we have sworn to serve. This is our chance to continue moving Louisiana forward. Now, I know we're not used to hearing the word surplus around here very often, but I've actually checked with a number of economists, and it turns out that surpluses are actually better than deficits. <laughs> Unlike in the past, today we have the opportunity to put our names on a budget that we can all be proud of. All we have to do is recognize the revenue that's right in front of us, and then we can get to work making real progress for our state. For the last year, you've heard me say that giving our teachers a pay raise is my number one priority. This is a well-deserved. This is well-deserved and long overdue because we're all here today in great part because dedicated teachers believed in us. I was blessed to have many amazing teachers growing up, right there in Amy, Louisiana. And I certainly wouldn't be standing here today if it weren't for my very favorite teacher, who's actually been by my side for more than 30 years. Met her in the seventh grade. <laughs> of course, I'm talking about my wife, Donna. But unfortunately, fewer young people are choosing to go into the teaching profession because they see the underfunded classrooms, lack of appreciation, and standstill pay. We have teachers preparing our children for the future while struggling to provide for their own. They're frustrated, and they have every right to be. Our teachers are so committed to the success of their students that most in fact, 94% are paying out of their own pockets for school supplies. 
So having said all that and for many other reasons, I want to bring our teacher pay up to speed with the other southern regional states, starting with the $1,000 pay raise this year. This would be the first step in a multi-year process because our teachers deserve more. Teachers like Ms. Chantel Roussel, who's been in the classroom for nearly 20 years. Chantel recently, <laughs> Chantel re recently returned to a school that is no stranger to her, Duplessis Primary in Ascension Parish, to be a kindergarten teacher, or at least that's what she thought. Chantel was asked to fill a position instead in special education that had been vacant for a month. It's a story we hear much too often these days, teachers having to fill multiple roles due to shortages. Teachers having to work multiple jobs just to make ends meet. But Chantel stepped up when her school and those students needed her. And now it is time for us to step up for her and for all teachers across our state. It is also important that we value the efforts of each person working in the school building. From those feeding students in the cafeteria to those ensuring that our classrooms are sanitary. As such, I also support a $500 raise for school support personnel across the state of Louisiana. The people who work in our school buildings are just as dedicated as the teachers in our classrooms. A perfect example of that is Patrick Landreth, who is a custodian at Moortown Elementary School in Shreveport. Patrick, I guess he left about 4 o'clock this morning, too, to get down here, but he arrives at work every day at about 4 a.m. He mows the lawn early so the students won't be distracted by the noise. He keeps the classroom spotless so the students have a welcoming place that they want to come to every single day. Simply put, he makes educating students possible, and he does so with enthusiasm, with a smile on his faith. Just like Kathleen Braden, who works at Moortown as a professional, uh, sorry, as a paraprofessional, while also working to attain her teaching certificate. Her supervisors say that she goes above and beyond to make lessons plans better and brings a wealth of knowledge from her background of teaching early childhood special education. She is an Army veteran, she's a grandmother, and she is a caregiver for her own mother. And I'm proud to say that Chantel, Patrick, and Kathy are all with us today. So if you will, please stand and be recognized. Thank you for your dedication to our students. And make no mistake, the pay goes to the adults, but the investment is in our children. As with teacher salaries, the state's per pupil allocation has been neglected for too long. In addition to giving our teachers a pay raise, I seek to invest more in the classroom with an increase of 1.375% in the MFP which would be just the second MFP increase in the last 10 years. It goes hand in hand with teacher pay, and that's why we included it in our budget proposal. I'm also committed to ensuring all high school students have access to dual enrollment opportunities at our colleges. Students who participate in dual enrollment are more likely to meet college readiness benchmarks, and they boast higher college completion rates. It's a chance for students to get real college experience before they get there. And it could even be a chance for Louisiana colleges to have an edge on keeping high-performing students in state after they finish high school. Dual enrollment is a leg up that should be afforded to any student who qualifies. Sadly, today this is not the case. That is why I support legislation designed to create a statewide framework to ensure that all eligible juniors and seniors across the state of Louisiana have access to dual enrollment, no matter their zip code and no matter their ability to pay. Yeah. 
We have a long road ahead of us before we reach true educational equity. But there are smart investments in education we can make today that will accelerate student success. Dual enrollment is one of them. Our teachers, by the way, aren't the only ones suffering from inadequate pay. Every year I stand here and make the case for why we should increase the minimum wage and pass equal pay legislation. And every year that goes by, we're falling further and further behind. So I challenge everyone in this room to look at your own finances, look at your family's finances, and try to imagine making it on $7 and a quarter an hour. For thousands, for thousands of Louisianans, that is their reality. And while we refuse to act, our neighbors in Arkansas have raised their minimum wage three times. Most recently with an $11 an hour ballot initiative that passed with 68% of the vote. I believe it's time to look outside the walls of this building and let the people of Louisiana decide if raising the minimum wage is the right thing to do. Therefore, <laughs> therefore I support a constitutional amendment to provide for a state minimum wage of $9 per hour effective July 1st, 2020. For three years, I've asked you to support an increase in the minimum wage in this state, and yet many workers in Louisiana are still no closer to a wage that can support a family or bring them out of poverty. So I ask you today, even if in the past you've not supported the minimum wage for our workers, give the people of this state a right to decide. I ask you to support this constitutional amendment to let the people of our great state use their voices and their votes to determine if we should join the other 44 states that have enacted a minimum wage. <laughs> Additionally, Louisiana continues to have the highest gender wage gap in the country. This gap exists in all fields, regardless of profession or educational background, and jobs predominantly filled by women or paid less than jobs mostly filled by men. And this ought to offend all of us. As I've said before, there really is no point in talking about family values if we aren't actively valuing families. I am, I am advancing legislation to eliminate pay secrecy by prohibiting employers from taking action against employees for merely inquiring about, discussing, or disclosing their wages or another employee's wages. I mean, do you really believe someone should be able to be fired for discussing their salary? This is the right thing to do, and we know that it will help close the wage gap. The health of our people should also be a priority this session. Medicaid expansion was a huge leap forward in improving health outcomes, but it is far from the finish line. I'm committed to ensuring that every applicant for health insurance in Louisiana is not denied access to coverage because of a pre-existing condition. We all know the Affordable Care Act is flawed, but we should not have to fight to protect a provision that is overwhelmingly supported by most people in this state and throughout the nation. And for me, this is a personal issue. I know what it's like to be a young first-time parent hearing the doctor tell you that your child will face lifelong medical challenges. And I know many parents like us, we would all spend our very last penny to get the child the care that they need. But it shouldn't have to be that way. There are 850,000 other Louisianans who have found themselves in a similar situation. And when you look at the list of conditions that qualify as pre-existing, either you or someone you know, practically every family in our state has been personally impacted. I hope as we move forward through this session that there is a very robust discussion about how we can continue to protect those, like my daughter and like so many other family and friends with pre-existing conditions. And we should also have a robust discussion as to why that coverage is now at risk. I do not want the nearly one million Louisianans living with pre-existing conditions to get caught in the middle of Washington-style politics. 
They deserve better than that. So let's all work together to find out what really works to maintain coverage for people with pre-existing conditions while ensuring that insurance costs do not go up. You know, in 2017, we scored a major victory in the fight against, opioid, against the opioid epidemic by enacting a seven-day prescription limit for opioids. And this year, I propose that we continue to chart a new course in addressing opioid-related harms. I support legislation to enhance data reporting of fatal and non-fatal drug overdoses where opioids are suspected or present. And this will create a, a mechanism for rapid surveillance of overdoses in the state, which will help better inform us of how to prevent, intervene in, and treat opioid addiction. It will allow us to continue to find better ways to fight this problem, which is ripping so many of our families apart. We are also taking aggressive measures to address Louisiana's deteriorating water infrastructure. You know, water is something that we too often take for granted, and yet it is as essential to life as breathing. Over half of the water systems in our state are more than 50 years old. The situation is especially critical in rural areas. And when water systems fail, emergency actions on the part of the state are required. When I took office in 2016, the water coming out of faucets in St. Joseph looked like this. Now, it looks like the water that I've been drinking here this afternoon. But the town of St. Joseph is not alone in facing challenges with its water system. So last year I launched a working group to address the water infrastructure needs of rural communities across the state. Our goal is to bring existing resources together in a coordinated and collaborative effort. Already we have secured $10.8 million in Delta Regional Authority investments which were leveraged with other public and private dollars to bring in a total of $131 million for projects in the 56 distressed DRA parishes. By creating a permanent body, we will be able to make a long-term, robust approach to address these immediate needs. Last, but certainly not least, let's do more to support Louisiana veterans. Already, we have expanded the Military Family Assistance Fund, established a Women's Veterans Outreach Program, and announced the opening of 30 new veteran centers on higher education campuses across the state. And, <laughs> in fact, the Veterans Center at LSU in Baton Rouge was named the best in the nation last year. We know that our veterans don't stop serving when they come home. They continue to play an integral part in our communities and in our economy. Therefore, I support legislation establishing the Veterans First Business Initiative. This statewide initiative is designed to identify veteran-owned businesses in Louisiana, create a veteran-owned business designation that they can use, and develop a website for Louisianans to search for various goods or services from veteran-owned businesses. For example, one of the veteran-owned businesses that would be featured on this website is a Baton Rouge restaurant called BRQ. The co-owner, Justin Ferguson, is an Army veteran who completed two tours in Iraq. Justin makes it a priority to hire other veterans who, like him, face the struggles of returning to civilian life. And Justin, he is with us today. So would you please stand and be recognized, Justin? Thank you so much. Justin, thank you for your service to our country. And I want to thank you for supporting other veterans as well with jobs and training. You represent the very best of the spirit of the military, of working hard and never leaving anyone behind. And folks, I've actually had his food before. And he doesn't just know how to lead and inspire. He can really cook, too. So Justin, thank you for that. 
So here's what I think is important to remember. We've made tremendous progress in the last three and a half years, not because of one party, not because of one person, but because many people from different parties have come together to make it happen. And we live in a time when it seems like people are becoming ever more divided, where they work to one-up each other instead of fighting together for a better Louisiana. But let me tell you, I've learned a lot in my time traveling the state. I've been fishing off the, off the coast with our fishermen and with shrimpers. I've been to National Guard ceremonies to honor our soldiers and airmen as they are deployed all over the world. I've enjoyed a pea cookout with farmers in Bastrop while listening to their concerns about the future of agriculture. I've prayed with families who lost everything in the floods. I've celebrated with new graduates and their proud families from Northwestern State to Delgado and from Grambling to Suwella. And no matter where I go across this great state, I am more and more convinced that there is far more that unites us than divides us. And today I'm standing here before you in a room full of people who care about this great state and her amazing people. That breeze of hope that I spoke of in 2016 is still blowing. It's gotten us this far, and it can carry us into the future that we all want for our children and our grandchildren. And I am more optimistic, I am more bullish on the future of Louisiana than I have ever been. And how can I not be? I am standing here in a room of Louisianans. I am proud to stand with you. And together, we can continue moving Louisiana in the right direction. So let's get it done. God bless you, and God bless the great state of Louisiana. You have been watching Governor John Bell Edwards and his address uh, to the opening of the Louisiana legislature. You see the uh, ovation for uh, the governor and uh, Barry Irwin here in studio with me. I'm Andre Morrow. Uh, more of a campaign kickoff overtone uh, and definite uh, feel uh, than some of the past addresses to the legislature, huh? Yeah, it sure sounded like it. I mean, the first half almost was sort of uh, a litany of accomplishments, uh, everything from big economic development wins, Medicaid expansion, reductions in abortions, increases in adoptions, <laughs> all of those type things. And uh, he got quite a bit of applause and recognition during that phase of the speech. Yeah. Uh, we went on later on to talk about some of the other issues and not quite so much response there. No, but it certainly touched on, uh, first off, touching on the GDP, uh, our economy, touched on health, of course, as expected, and then went on down to uh, enlist and, and show people who we're with them here in the uh, in the legislative chambers, uh, celebrating their successes because of some of the programs that he supported. Absolutely, I mean that has been kind of a ritual in recent years to yeah. kind of uh, highlight folks and bring them into the chamber. Uh, certainly, there's good uh, applause and good response to those things. So, really, that first part of it really was, and actually towards the end too. I think there you saw or heard a kind of a hope for the future, kind of a, a vision. Let's go forward together. Um, so, I think it really was a kickoff in a lot of ways. And and really, you're right too. The mood is a lot different now. We were we, each year during the previous years, we knew we were coming into very difficult budget situations, things that were going to be contentious. It's certainly less so right now. Okay, but let me ask you, will that make any difference now as they hit the ground running going forward for the next 60 days? I think that's a big question. I think you heard the governor himself allude to the revenue estimating conference, the budget issues that might still be out there for those dollars that have not yet been recognized. A little jab there in the House chamber. Yeah. So, um, and then the, the response was a little cooler uh, as you went into some of those things for some of the priorities that he's pushing for this session. So, um, you know, these things are never easy, but um, hopefully we'll see something that's a little bit smoother this time and, and maybe less partisan. Okay, Barry. Well, we thank you. And of sure. course, uh, we're going to be here uh, to cover the legislature as it continues uh, for its duration and hopefully not an extra session <laughs> in there. But thank you so much for joining us. We're going to have a wrap of the first week of things and a look ahead to the big topics of the Louisiana legislature uh, here on Friday night on our coverage of SWI, this week's edition of The State We're In. So thanks so much for joining us. That, of course, is Friday night at 7, by the way. Thanks for joining us here. Uh, I'll send you back now to our regular programming.